this is the slide that is mandatory for everyone to see who attends an LT Spy seminar. My boss told me this slide has to be here. Um, you know, um, he says, now Mike, if you're gonna go travel, if we're gonna send you around the world talking about LT Spice, make sure they know it's good for switchboard power supplies. We sell close to a billion dollars a year in switchboard power supplies. You better know that LT Spice is good for switchboard power supplies. So that's why this slide is here. Now, he, this is actually my least favorite slide. The problem is there is nothing in LT Spice that's really special for switch mode power supplies. For example, when it's solving that switch mode power supply, LT Spice doesn't know it's a switch mode power supply. It's just solving the thing from first principles with brute force. It just does it real fast so that switch mode power supply simulation is interactive. So this slide is pure PowerPoint engineering. But it talks about, it lets me talk, it, it, I'm gonna start talking about models and I'm gonna spend the rest of the day talking about models and third party models and so on. Now, the, uh, there is one thing in, in SPICE that's nice for switchboard power supplies and that is that it actually has a power MOSFET. That's the most important thing, that there actually is a circuit element that behaves like a power MOSFET. See, the power MOSFET is very different than a monolithic MOSFET. This is the cross-section of the monolithic MOSFET. By monolithic, I mean lithographed on a piece of silicon. This is a monolithic MOSFET, and that's a discrete power MOSFET. Now, in a monolithic MOSFET, everything's lithographed on the same side. So there's the source gate and drain all on the same side of the silicon. And the gate here, uh, the gate defines the channel. The size of the polysilicon of the gate defines, it defines this channel region here. The length of the channel is the distance from there to there. That's the length of the channel. And the width of the channel would be the direction you know, uh, into the board. If you've seen the cross-section of one monolithic MOSFET, you've seen them all. I mean, the only difference would be their mechanical dimensions, their length and their widths. And then um, the sizes and shapes of these transistors and how they're interconnected, that's what determines whether that op amp is a, or whether that integrated circuit is an op amp or a microprocessor. But all the MOSFETs look the same. Now, if you want to make a high gain MOSFET, say for a differential input differential pair for an op amp, you know, high gain, high transconductance, where the same size change in gate source voltage gives you a bigger change in drain source current, then the, um, uh, what you have to do is um, print the transistor very wide so that the same size change in gate source current gives you a bigger change in drain source current. But the same size change in gate source voltage gives you a bigger change in drain source current. Now the practical dimensions, so for an op amp, you know, that input differential pair might be a channel length of one micron and a channel width of 100 microns or a millimeter, whatever will fit on the die. But if you want to make a power MOSFET, something where a change in one volt in gate source voltage gives you a change of decades of drain source amps, a uh, decade of amps of drain source current, then the practical dimensions of that MOSFET become a channel, uh, the channel length will be one half of a micron and the channel width will be 10 meters. That actually is the practical dimensions of the power MOSFETs you use. When you go buy a power MOSFET, that's a 10 meter wide transistor. See, that's a very small area. Half a micron by 10 meters, a few square millimeters, and you could put it inside of a die that's a few millimeters on the side. You could probably put six of them inside of a TO220 package and they just rattle around. Okay, so your MOSFETs are 10 meters wide and half meter long. That's the average size of a power MOSFET. Now, to, to make that very wide MOSFET fit into a small package, or small, fit on a small die, the electrodes are rearranged. They look like this. The gate is an array of islands of polysilicon. These might be rectangular shaped islands or hexagonal shaped islands, but that's the gate. And there's many of these structures. The channel is this region here. This is channel and that is channel, and the channel goes all the way around the gate. So the width of the transistor is the perimeter of one piece of polysilicon times the number of uh, uh, gate polysilicon islands on the die, and that could be 10 meters. 
The source is one massive metallization that goes over, goes over the whole side of the die. Now, you could put the drain on the same side of the die as the gauge and the source. That's the normal thing to do. And honestly, that's the easier thing to do. But if you were to put the uh, drain on the same side of the die as the gauge and the source, then you would have to dike up so much source metallization so as to appreciably increase the on resistance of the MOSFET. And so instead, the drain is put on the back of the die. Okay, and the fact that the drain is on the back of the die, that's what the V is about in VD MOS transistor. V stands for vertical current through the die. The D of VD MOS stands for double diffuse, as there's a process schedule you have to go through in order to get the drain electrically on the back of the die. But that's your VD MOS transistor, and that's your monolithic MOSFET transistor. Now these two things are both MOSFETs. I mean, if you curve trace these things, the same device equations for this are, uh, same device equations for this apply to that. The channel is too small to have a personality. Okay, it's exactly the same device equations. If the only difference is the vertical axis on this would be labeled a microamp and the vertical axis of this would be decades of amps. But otherwise, the channel equations are the same. Now, where differences happen is there's different parasitic devices. This device here has a substrate and you will get a forward PN junction conductivity between the bulk and the source here. If the source, I'm sorry, between the source, you'll get forward PN uh, uh, conduction if the source or drain go negative with respect to the source. That's what this little arrow is about. This arrow is trying to tell you if you make this below the base voltage, you get a forward PN conductivity. If you make the drain negative with respect to the bulk, you get a forward PN conductivity there. And, um, uh, so the, the monolithic MOSFET is intrinsically a three-terminal device. Now this thing here, there is no bulk, but there's a body diode. The body diode is over here. And the body diode, th this symbol is used for the power MOSFET, but because uh, it, it, it is sort of like you've taken the bulk and connected to the source. You'll never get conductivity through the source no matter what you do because the, bo the body diode would be reverse biased. But if you make the drain negative with respect to the source, you will get a forward conductivity. So if you just buzz the thing out with where you get conductivity or not between these three terminals, it's a lot like you've just taken the bulk and connected it to the source. But if you quantify the conductivity of that PN junction conductivity, you realize no, it's actually an entirely different conductivity path because the conductivity, this resistance, is much less resistance than this one or this one. So if you, if you just you know, buzz it out with an ohmmeter, yeah, you would, you would, it would, it's like this, but if you quantitate where that, what the conductivity is, you realize it cannot be hooked up like that. It's actually like this. But you know what? That's just the parasitic junction. That's just the body diode, and gentlemen, don't put current through the body diode, so let's not worry about that. The big difference between these two structures is that they, char they store charge fundamentally differently. Because the electrodes are rearranged, they have different intercapacitance electrodes. And let's focus on the gate drain capacitance. That's the Miller capacitance, and that's the physical quantity that, powers, uh, that, that determines how this thing switches. Now this structure here, the gate drain capacitance is due to electric field lines through here. And those electric field lines aren't strongly bent independent of whether this channel region is conducting or not. So this structure has essentially the same gate drain capacitance independent of whether the transistor is on or off. But that's not the story over here. This is the channel, that's channel. It's in between the gate and the drain. And it's worse than it looks in this picture because this region is mostly conductive. When this transistor is off, most of the dielectric between the gate and the drain is the channel. And when you turn the transistor on, you've, got, you've lost most of the dielectric between the gate and the drain, so it has a lot more capacitance. The difference in gate drain capacitance typically varies by a factor of three to five in a power MOSFET when it's on or off. Now it's often obscured by the uh, gate source capacitance. There's a huge capacity between the gate and the source, so that huge Miller capacitance changes off and obscured in a data sheet, but that's a big change in Miller capacitance. Thing is, you can't use the device equations of this structure that actually switch like a power MOSFET. You just have the wrong device equations. So, what this means, oh, okay, now, now at, um, uh, for as far as you know, the thing with, with this is the thing. Yeah. spice programs have this, 
All SPICE programs can simulate that because SPICE was about IC design. SPICE was an acronym and the letters IC and the name SPICE stand for Integrated Circuit. And the idea for SPICE was to simulate anything that you could lithograph on an integrated circuit and that seems like a, a reasonable guidance to be able to simulate an IC. Sort of true, but what if you, your IC is uh, driving a power MOSFET? You need to simulate that too to see how the IC does. And um, they don't have this structure. There's no device equations in SPICE programs to handle this. So at, uh, at Analog Devices, we developed uh, the device equations of this structure. And uh, we have a device, it's a native circuit element that behaves like a power MOSFET. And we have this native circuit structure that can duplicate the gate charge behavior curves as you see on a, on a data sheet. You know, on a data sheet, they'll tell you how much charge you have to put on the gate to enhance the channel. And what they do is they have a plot, the horizontal axis is charge and the vertical axis is voltage, and it tells you what voltage you go to after having gone through the trouble of putting so much nanocoulomb on the gate. That's the plot you see in a data sheet, and that plot is extracted with a test fixture that looks like this. They, um, the, this plot will depend, how much charge you have to put on the gate depends on how much current you're switching and depends on how much voltage you're switching. So the fixture looks like this. You're switching, um, you put a constant current into the gate, and that way, Time is charge because it's a constant current times time. Since this is microamp and those are millisecond, you can read these numbers as numerically equal to the nanocoulomb on the gate. Then, um, if you that is, okay, so the gate starts at zero voltage. See so the source is at voltage. This is zero gate source voltage. As you put charge of the gate, this slope here, this slope corresponds to a capacitance. And then at this point, you've hit the, the threshold voltage. And at that point, the drain starts slewing negative, and the drain will just go to wherever voltage is necessary to gobble up the charge you put on the gate. At that point, the drain has hit the negative rail, and it can't slew anymore. It can't gobble up any more charge. So if you put more current into the gate, the thing will run. Let me run the simulation so I can plug the drain too. OK, so this is the uh, gate charge. And that's the drain. You can see the drain just loses whatever voltage is necessary. It has this nonlinear form because it's a nonlinear gate source, uh, gate drain capacitance. All right. Uh, and the fact that this slope is different than that slope is due to the fact it's a, a vertical MOSFET, not a monolithic MOSFET. Now, what this means to you is you should never use the third party models for a MOSFET. MOSFET vendors make SPICE models for their MOSFETs. They have good intentions, but they're trying to make a, a MOSFET that will run in a generic SPICE program, and a generic SPICE program doesn't have the device equations in it that behaves like a power MOSFET. Just don't use them. They, will, they are not useful models. Instead, use assisted mode for editing the MOSFET. Right click on the MOSFET, pick new MOSFET. You can sort by selection guide information by clicking on the headings and it remembers the order in which you click on them. So first click on gate charge, then click on RDS on. Pick a MOSFET with the similar art with same RDS on and similar gate charge and simulate with that MOSFET. Then um, do the simulation with that MOSFET with the same gate charge requirement and same RDS on. Then when it comes to actually building the circuit, you can use any source you feel like. I mean, as long as Alltech carries them, right? I mean, he's not paying attention anymore. Okay. And by the way, these, um, these models in LT Spice, these actually are the third party models. The semiconductor manufacturers send me the models and I put them in. You actually are using models from the vendor when you do that. That's the way, that's the way most of them are. International Rectifier, now Siemens, and Siemens does that, our own does that, and so on. Okay, yeah. It's either a MOSFET or it's a native circuit element or it is a sub-circuit. If the third party model is a MOSFET, the answer is you don't use it. It's incorrect model. It cannot possibly be correct. You use one that's an LT spice. Now, if the other two situations, I will show how to use third party models. If it's implemented as uh, uh, how to show whether it's a, if, if it's a dot model statement or a dot sub circuit, 
Now, the difference between these two, if it's a dot model statement, it's modeled as a native circuit element, you know, uh, where if it's a sub-circuit, it's some library circuitry that's supposed to behave like some, some part that, you know, okay, now take, a, take the dot model statement. All right, to use a dot model statement in your simulator, uh, you're gonna have to know, okay, to use a model in LTSpice, a model is a text file. You're going to have to look at the model to see how it is implemented. And um, uh, this is the, say you want to use a 1N4707 diode in LTSpice. There is no 1N4707 model in LTSpice. And it's not because I don't like the diode. The reason why the model is not part of the distribution is because I'm afraid someone will use it in a switch mode power supply and not have a happy day. Okay, so if you want to simulate with this diode, you go to OnSemi. If you follow to the end of the URL, you will get this text file. You have to look at the text file. Okay, stars are comments. Comment, comment, comment. There says dot model, a name, D in a bunch of parameters. Okay, so this is done with a dot model statement, not a dot subcircuit statement. Now the guy who made this model, his, he's thinking this. He's thinking, Spice already has the IV curve of a diode as a built-in device equation. All I need to do is parameterize the built-in equation to match my product, to curve fit my product, and I made a model for my product. That's what's happening. So. All these numbers are parameterizing the built-in device equations. And to use this model, all you have to do is put a diode. You already have a symbol for all the native circuit elements, and you make the value of the symbol, this text, coincide with that text. And then you include the model in the simulation, which here I've done by putting it on the schematic, and you've imported this model, and you can simulate it. And that's, that's the easy case. Uh, you don't have to put the model on the schematic, you could put it in the diode model database so that when you right clicked on the diode and said pick new diode, it shows up in this list. Okay, dot model statements are, are the easy situation. And you'll find um, diodes are often distributed that way, sometimes bipolar transistors. Again, you already have a bipolar transistor symbol, you just make the value of the transistor coincide with the name of the model and often JFETs are that way. This is a Japanese JFET, and here you can see, um, you can curve trace that. So that's the easy situation. Where people run into trouble is when the model is implemented as a dot subcircuit statement. Now, the, the thing is, be, it, when you have it implemented as a dot subcircuit statement, it's some library circuitry, uh, and um, uh, that's cobbled together to behave like the uh, I see that's being modeled. Now because LT Spice is a physical simulator, there should, should be a highly analogous, pro, highly analogous procedure to using a model in a, uh, a third party model in LT Spice. There should be an analogous procedure to using a sample on a bench. You know, there should be, it should be a similar process because it's a physical simulator. Now what do you have to do if you're gonna use a sample on the bench? We have to get the model, then you have to find, read the data sheet and find the pin out and get that part connected in your circuit and go on your way. And the thing you have to do with LT Spice is very similar. You have the sub-circuit with these ports and you have to get these ports connected into the net list. Good, engineers understand that, they know about pins, they figure, and they've dealt with netlists because they've all done layout verification of PC boards. They figure, I got this. And then they make a mistake. They read the help file. All right, don't do that. Now there's nothing wrong with the help file. It's not that it's not complete or accurate or even lucid. The problem is there are times when we just have to accept what we are for a species. We do not read the words on the paper. We read the words that we're thinking in our heads. That's just what we are as a species. And the thing is, is that people will not, you know, people will confuse the number three with a string of Arabic numeral three, with spice order three, with the third port on the subcircuit line, with the pin called three. Those are all different threes. So look, don't read the help file, okay? 
Let me show you the one and only way you should ever use a third-party model if that model is supplied as a netlist. I have at great preponderance made this as simple and direct and easy as I can at all whatsoever imagine. Step one, open the file in LTSpice. This is a text file. LTSpice has a text editor and you open the file and here you see not only does LTSpice have a text editor, it will colorize spice syntax. The uh, green is a comment, dot command is blue, that normal netless line is black. Good. This particular part is from Acme Semiconductor, and that's the supplier for that coyote I like to watch on Saturday mornings. But anyway, so step one, open the file in, in LT Spice. Step two, point at the line that starts dot subcircuit. Okay, now, in a text editor, there's two ways of pointing. One is with the little blinky blinky, and the other is with the mouse cursor. All right, well, don't worry about the blinky blinky. Just use the mouse cursor. Point at the line that says dot subcircuit. That's step two. Point at the line that reads dot subcircuit. Step three, right click, create symbol. And there it is. The model's imported. Now, I realize this symbol is just a square box, but the significance of this symbol is that these pins netlist against those ports. So that's done, you know, by machine without mistake. And another value of this symbol is that this symbol is programmed to include this model whenever the symbol is on a schematic. That's almost magic. It dynamically links the model that you need. And the reason why LTSpice can program the symbol to do that is because step one was open the file in LTSpice. So LTSpice knows the path. Here's another thing that happens. You know, I show people how to use third-party models. I do the seminar, and two days later I get an email. So it's, and the email goes like this. Okay, I've got all these third-party models I want to use. I'm not going to tell you where I got them, but I went to the seminar and I'm not going to read the help file. What directory should I put these in? It's going to be okay. You should have a quiet moment and reflect on where you would like to have those files on your hard disk. Right there, that's where they go. That's where you put them. And then because step one was you open the file in LTSpice, you've shared with LTSpice your divine sense of organization because it now knows the path. Everything comes from opening the file in LTSpice. If you remember that, it would be fine. And then, um, uh, so anyway, once I've made the symbol, yes, it shows you the symbol in the graphical symbol editor, and you can rearrange pins and change the shape of it so it has some graphical significance to you and so on. But as soon as you've done all that, that's okay. You can immediately draft a schematic and run the simulation. This particular part was an op amp, and you can see the thing clip. I mean, I have literally really thought about how to make this as easy as possible, and I don't know how to make it easier than that. You have a question right there. If you look at the pin currents of an op amp implemented in Boyle methodology, you can fairly and objectively come to the conclusion that the Boyle model feels that Kirchhoff's law is just a recommendation. And um, let me show you. Uh, let me show you what I mean. And, and everybody used to do this back in the day. Linear Tech did that also. Let's take the LT1001. Linear, I came in, I entered analog devices through Linear Tech. The LT1001 was designed 30 years ago. It's still available today. And we distributed Boyle model implemented, uh, Boyle implemented models. And let's compare the Boyle model to the LTSpice version. Specifically looking at pin currents. Positive supply pin current, negative supply pin current. Now the positive supply pin current is 1.6 milliamps. Negative supply pin current is minus 1.6 milliamps. Again, pin current sign convention is positive into the pin. So this data means there's 1.6 milliamps flowing in the positive pin and out the negative pin. Sounds good? 
until we look at the output current, 10 milliamps. Yes, that should cause a reaction, exactly right. And I think that um, you can actually judge a person's character by the way they react to this, you know. So, I, mean, if you, I mean, I'm not talking about in simulation, but um, say you were on the bench and you saw a part behave like this. You know, one person might look at this and say, I put 1.6 milliamps in and I get 10 milliamps out. I'm gonna write a paper and I'm gonna be famous. And as you cross as he sold. Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> he wants to be famous. That's the thing. I mean, this is a, a test of a person's character, the way they respond to that. A person who reacts to this, pro this situation, that situation, he wants to be famous. That's what motivates him. Now, another person would look at this and say, 1.6 milliamps in, uh, 10 milliamps out. I'm going to keep this a secret, and I am going to patent it, and I'm going to be rich. Well, he's motivated by money. That's who he is as a person, okay? He's motivated by money. Now, another person would be more along the lines of, of what your reaction was. You know, they'd say, oh my God, this part is emitting energy. We're going to harness this energy and we'll solve all the problems on the planet and we'll have world peace. Well, he's just a people pleaser. That's all, there's no depth of character there, you know, there's nothing going on. Now, my reaction to this, you know, if I saw this, you know, this is bigger than wealth or fame. This is bigger than world peace, okay? If I saw a park behave like this on the bench, I would immediately disconnect my association with technology, and I would spend the rest of my life feverishly studying religion, okay? Because <laughs> this is a miracle, okay? And this is bigger than anything on this planet, and I would, you know, that's what I would do. Now, if you try this at home, this is not the, behave the reaction, this is not what's gonna happen. Here, positive supply pin current, negative supply pin current, current. It's just going to steer current about the pins, okay? I know, exactly. It's boring, you know? And it's, it's, it's you know, and it's going to have the right small signal response. It'll have the right output drive capability. We do the best we can in the output impedance, so the overshoot into capacitive load will be about right. Input capacitances are modeled, so if you use a real high impedance voltage divider around it, the extra pull from the input cap, so that'll be modeled in there. Input common mode range, you know, it's just going to act like the op amp. It's completely boring, okay? No excitement whatsoever. Now, no world peace. huh? No world peace. no world peace. I know, and that's that's the downside. <laughs> that's it. The, the right side is that the upside is that it's that's correct. The downside is no world peace. All right. The um, another problem with the boil model deals with the way it handles stochastic noise. It's very rare to see a boil model that gets stochastic noise correct. And for that, let me talk about the LT ten twenty eight. The LT1028 is a part that impacted my life. Before I worked at Linear Tech Corp, you know, before I, I worked at this company here, or that one, before I worked there, I heard of it because of the LT1028. The LT1028 the LT was the lowest voltage noise op amp available, and I had big use for it. In the 1980s, I was designing instrumentation for explorative oil drilling. Now you need to understand how oil is found. It's, it's found by rock resistivity. Once you, once you go a thousand feet below the Earth's surface, what you have is salt water everywhere on the planet. If you go a thousand feet below, it's salt water and it's conductive everywhere on the whole planet. However, wherever you have hydrocarbons, the salt doesn't dissolve in oil. So that is uh, because there's no salt in the oil, it's highly resistive. And it's by measuring rock resistivity is how you find the oil. High resistivity rock is 100% of the ID that you found oil. That's how it is found. It's been done that way for 70 years and it's the only method of finding oil. Now there's a little bit um, 
uh, uh, problematic in applying that in, um, oil, uh, in normal um, heavy oil exploration. See, the thing is, when you're drilling a hole, if you run into any fluid, that fluid is lighter than rock, whether it's water or oil. Like if you hit oil when you're drilling, it's lighter than rock, it's gonna to wanna to float, which means it's gonna to wanna to come out of that hole with a whole bunch of force, with thousands and thousands of PSI pressure, because you have a mile or two, a few miles of rock on top of it, trying to get it to come out. Um, now, that's really dangerous. You can't have a blowout at an oil well. It could kill the people working the well, and it's environmentally intolerable. So what you do is you're drilling the hole. You replace the rock that you take out with a very dense fluid. It's expensive fluid. When you're done using it here, you'll take it out and put it in a different, different well. And uh, so you weight the, the column down as you're drilling so you don't get a blowout. Now, this, this stuff is so expensive, you don't want it to leach out into the formation. So you put this mud cake around the side of the well so that this heavy column is sealed against the well and, you can, and that's the way it's done. Now once you're all done, you pull out the drill string and you got the column weighted down with this, uh, this heavy, uh, heavy fluid. Now you need to measure the resistivity of the formation, but this heavy stuff is conductive. And so is the mud cake, it's all conductive. You have to measure the resistivity through the conductive region behind, behind all that into the rock formation. You'd like to measure it uninvaded rock, say six feet away from the drill, uh, the borehole. So the way you do that is with inductively coupling eddy currents to the field out there. You, you have an antenna that emits a field and then you listen to this thing with other little preamps, other coils. It's basically a, a metal detector, okay? sort of working in reverse because you're looking for high resistivity, not the conductive res res parts. My job is to make the preamps for these antenna coils to listen to these weak currents through this uh, heavily conductive uh, borehole region. All right, and the thing is, once you go down hole, there's no man-made noise. It's all stochastic noise, it's all quantum noise limited uh, uh, situation. And basically, the better noise performance from your preamplifiers, the more oil you're gonna find. I had to design these preamps. Now because of the LT1028, I did not have to make a, a, trans a discrete transistor preamplifier. I could use this thing. Its typical voice noise density was 0.85 nanovolt per root hertz. It was uh, you know, order of magnitude quieter than other op amps of the day. It was the lowest voltage noise op amp available. I believe it's still the lowest voltage noise op uh, operational amplifier available even to this state as far as the voltage noise density. Okay, that's what the LT1028 is. Now let's talk about the circuit. You got a 10 ohm resistor and a 10K resistor. That means the voltage gain is programmed to be 1000. And because this is 10 ohms connected to the inverting end, the non-inverting end is connected to a voltage source, it means that any current noise will be shorted out and the voltage noise would be amplified by a factor of 1,000. This circuit is a voltage noise test fixture. That's what it is. Now what noise should we have? Input noise current density typically is 0.85 nanovolt per root hertz times 1,000. Should be 0.85 microvolt per root hertz. That resistor will contribute a Johnson noise that will convolute into the noise density of the op amp and the output should be one microvolt per root hertz. That would be the correct density for the output reference noise density of that op amp, a microvolt per root hertz. Let's compare what we get the boil, op, uh, boil op, uh, uh, model compared to the LT splice model. Okay, we should have a, a microvolt, and look, it's over a millivolt. And that's just sad that the lowest voltage noise op amp commercially available has its noise incorrectly modeled by 60 dB. But if you look at the LT spice model, we're expecting a microvolt and that's what we get, one microvolt. It's the right noise density here. Now it increases at low frequency and that's because the corner frequency, this is, this is the one over F noise of the LT1028. Its voltage noise density corner frequency is three hertz here. And that's where it's uh, uh, turning the corner up. 
Now let's talk about this high frequency part here. At 10 megahertz, I don't see hardly any noise out of this LT1028, but the LT1028 certainly has noise at 10 megahertz, but it doesn't have a gain of 1,000 at 10 megahertz. So the voltage noise test fixture doesn't work at that frequency. And there's only one more piece of structure to explain, and it's that. That is exactly what an LT1028 does. The LT1028 has a noisy intermediate stage. And if you, do, if, you don't, if you run the part without global feedback, then you see that noisy intermediate stage impressed on the output instead of being regulated out against according, uh, according to the input reference noise. It's an exact noise model. That's what the thing is. Now let me tell you the noise mechanisms which are included in LT splice op amp models. First of all, there's voltage noise density and obviously voltage noise density over frequency. And there's current noise density. I don't, I don't do the current noise density here, but there's current noise density over frequency. And we don't just model voltage, voltage and current noise over frequency. We model them over bias conditions because the noise of an op amp depends on how it is biased. Let's look at the input pair of, a, of an op amp. Okay, now this thing would have a common mode range to the positive rail, but it won't, the common mode range won't extend to the negative rail because this current source needs some voltage headroom to behave like a current. So if you want to make a rail-to-rail -rail input op amp, you actually have two input stages. You have an end stage that looks like this, and you have a P stage. The common rail range of this device would go to the negative rail, maybe even a little below, but it can't go to the positive rail because this current source needs some headroom. So you use both of these input stages and then you have circuitry inside the op amp that selects which output to use depending on how, what the common mode voltage is. So that's what the op amp looks like. And the models will look at which pair is active and report the noise appropriately. But there's more. Oh, you have a question back there. If you look at the pin currents of an op amp implemented in Boyle methodology, you can fairly and objectively come to the conclusion that the Boyle model feels that Kirchhoff's law it's just a recommendation. And um, let me show you, uh, let me show you what I mean. And, and everybody used to do this. Back in the day, Linear Tech did that also. Let's take the LT1001. Linear, I came in, I entered analog devices through Linear Tech. The LT1001 was designed 30 years ago. It's still available today. And we distributed Boyle model implemented, uh, Boyle implemented models. And let's compare the Boyle model to the LT Spice version. Specifically look at the pin currents. Positive supply pin current, negative supply pin current. Now the positive supply pin current is 1.6 milliamps. Negative supply pin current is minus 1.6 milliamps. Again, pin current sign convention is positive into the pin. So this data means there's 1.6 milliamps flowing in the positive pin and out the negative pin. Sounds good. Until we look at the output current. 10 milliamps. Yes, that should cause a reaction, exactly right. And I think that um, you can actually judge a person's character by the way they react to this, you know. So, I, mean, if you, I mean, I'm not talking about in simulation, but um, say you were on the bench and you saw a part behave like this. You know, one person might look at this and say, I put 1.6 milliamps in and I get 10 milliamps out. I'm gonna write a paper and I'm gonna be famous well, we'll get to that. He wants to be famous. That's the thing. I mean, this is a, a test of a person's character, the way they respond to that. A person who reacts to this, this situation, that situation, he wants to be famous. That's what motivates him. Now, another person would look at this and say, 1.6 milliamps in, uh, 10 milliamps out. 
I'm going to keep this a secret and I am going to patent it and I'm going to be rich. Well, he's motivated by money. That's who he is as a person, okay? He's motivated by money. Now, another person would be more along the lines of, of what your reaction was. You know, they'd say, oh my God, this part is emitting energy. We're going to harness this energy and we'll solve all the problems on the planet and we'll have world peace. <laughs> well, he's just a people pleaser. That's all, there's no depth of character there, you know, there's nothing going on. Now, my reaction to this, you know, if I saw this, you know, this is bigger than wealth or fame. This is bigger than world peace, okay? If I saw a part behave like this on the bench, I would immediately disconnect my association with technology. And I would spend the rest of my life feverishly studying religion, okay? Because <laughs> this is a miracle, okay? And this is bigger than anything on this planet. And I would, you know, that's what I would do. Now, if you try this at home, this is not the behavior, the reaction, this is not what's gonna happen. Here, positive supply pin current, negative supply pin current, current. It's just gonna steer current about the pins, okay? I know, exactly, it's boring, you know? And it's, 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 you know, and it's gonna have the right small signal response, it'll have the right output drive capability. We do the best we can in the output impedance so the overshoot into capacitive load will be about right. Input capacitances are modeled, so if you use a real high impedance voltage divider around it, the extra pull from the input cap, so that'll be modeled in there. Input common mode range, you know, it's just gonna act like the op amp. It's completely boring, okay? No excitement whatsoever. Now, no world peace. huh? No world peace. no world peace. I know, and that's that's the downside. <laughs> that's it. The, the right side is that the upside is that it's that's correct. The downside is no world peace. All right. The um, another problem with the boil model deals with the way it handles stochastic noise. It's very rare to see a boil model that gets stochastic noise correct. And for that, let me talk about the LT ten twenty eight. The LT1028 is a part that impacted my life. Before I worked at Linear Tech Corp, you know, before I, I worked at this company here, there, that one, before I worked there, I heard of it because of the LT1028. The LT1028 was the lowest voltage noise op amp available, and I had big use for it. In the 1980s, I was designing instrumentation for explorative oil drilling. Now you need to understand how oil is found. It's, it's found by rock resistivity. Once you, once you go a thousand feet below the Earth's surface, what you have is salt water everywhere on the planet. If you go a thousand feet below, it's salt water and it's conductive everywhere on the whole planet. However, wherever you have hydrocarbons, the salt doesn't dissolve in oil. So that is uh, because there's no salt in the oil, it's highly resistive. And it's by measuring rock resistivity is how you find the oil. High resistivity rock is 100% of the ID that you found oil. That's how it is found. It's been done that way for 70 years and it's the only method of finding oil. Now it's a little bit um, uh, uh, problematic in applying that in, um, oil, uh, in normal um, heavy oil exploration. See, the thing is, when you're drilling a hole, if you run into any fluid, that fluid is lighter than rock, whether it's water or oil. Like if you hit oil when you're drilling, it's lighter than rock, it's gonna to wanna to float, which means it's gonna to wanna to come out of that hole with a whole bunch of force, with thousands and thousands of PSI pressure, because you have a mile or two, a few miles of rock on top of it, trying to get it to come out. Um, now, that's really dangerous. You can't have a blowout at an oil well. It could kill the people working the well and it's environmentally intolerable. So what you do is you're drilling the hole, you replace the rock that you take out with a very dense fluid. It's expensive fluid. When you're done using it here, you'll take it out and put it in a different, different well. And uh, so you weight the, the column down as you're drilling so you don't get a blowout. 
Now this, this stuff is so expensive, you don't want it to leach out into the formation. So you put this mud cake around the side of the well so that this heavy column is sealed against the well and, you can, and that's the way it's done. Now once you're all done, you pull out the drill string and you got the column weighted down with this, uh, this heavy, uh, heavy fluid. Now you need to measure the resistivity of the formation, but this heavy stuff is conductive. And so is the mud cake, it's all conductive. You have to measure the resistivity through the conductive region behind, behind all that into the rock formation. You'd like to measure it uninvaded rock, say six feet away from the drill, uh, the borehole. So the way you do that is with inductively coupling eddy currents to the field out there. You, you have an antenna that emits a field and then you listen to this thing with other little preamps, other coils. It's basically a, a metal detector, okay? Sort of working in reverse because you're looking for high resistivity, not the conductive res res parts. My job is to make the preamps for these antenna coils to listen to these weak currents through this uh, heavily conductive uh, borehole region. All right, and the thing is, once you go down hole, there's no man-made noise. It's all stochastic noise, and it's all quantum noise limited uh, uh, situation. And basically, the better noise performance from your preamplifiers, the more oil you're gonna find. I had to design these preamps. Now, because of the LT1028, I did not have to make a, a, trans a discrete transistor preamplifier. I could use this thing. Its typical voice noise density was 0.85 nanovolt per root hertz. It was, uh, you know, order of magnitude quieter than other op amps of the day. It was the lowest voltage noise op amp available. I believe it's still the lowest voltage noise op uh, operational amplifier available even to the state, as far as the voltage noise density. Okay, that's what the LT1028 is. Now let's talk about the circuit. You got a 10 ohm resistor and a 10K resistor. That means the voltage gain is programmed to be 1000. And because this is 10 ohms connected to the inverting end, the non-inverting end is connected to a voltage source, it means that any current noise will be shorted out and the voltage noise will be amplified by a factor of 1,000. This circuit is a voltage noise test fixture. That's what it is. Now what noise should we have? Input noise current density typically is 0.85 nanovolt per root hertz times 1,000 should be 0.85 microvolt per root hertz. That resistor will contribute a Johnson noise that will convolute into the noise density of the op amp, and the output should be one microvolt per root hertz. That would be the correct density for the output reference noise density of that op amp, a microvolt per root hertz. Let's compare what we get the boil op, uh, boil op uh, uh, model compared to the LT splice model. Okay. We should have a, a microvolt, and look, it's over a millivolt. And that's just sad that the lowest voltage noise op amp commercially available has its noise incorrectly modeled by 60 dB. But if you look at the LT spice model, we're expecting a microvolt, and that's what we get, one microvolt. It's the right noise density here. Now it increases at low frequency, and that's because the corner frequency, this is, this is the one over F noise of the LT1028. Its voltage noise density corner frequency is three hertz here. And that's where it's uh, uh, turning the corner up. Now let's talk about this high frequency part here. At 10 megahertz, I don't see hardly any noise out of this LT1028, but the LT1028 certainly has noise at 10 megahertz, but it doesn't have a gain of 1,000 at 10 megahertz. So the voltage noise test fixture doesn't work at that frequency. And there's only one more piece of structure to explain, and it's that. That is exactly what an LT1028 does. The LT1028 has a noisy intermediate stage. And if you, do, if you, don't, if you run the part without global feedback, then you see that noisy intermediate stage impressed on the output instead of being regulated out against according, uh, according to the input reference noise. It's an exact noise model. That's what the thing is. Now let me tell you the noise mechanisms which are included in LT splice op amp models. First of all, there's voltage noise density, and obviously voltage noise density over frequency. And there's current noise density. I don't, I don't do the current noise density here, but there's current noise density over frequency. And we don't just model voltage, voltage and current noise over frequency, we model them over bias conditions because the noise of an op amp depends on how it is biased. 
Let's look at the input pair of, a, of an op amp. Okay. Now this thing would have a common mode range to the positive rail, but it won't, the common mode range won't extend to the negative rail because this current source needs some voltage headroom to behave like a current. So if you want to make a rail-to-rail -rail input op amp, you actually have two input stages. You have an N stage that looks like this, and you have a P stage. The common rail range of this device would go to the negative rail, maybe even a little below, but it can't go to the positive rail because this current source needs some headroom. So you use both of these input stages and then you have circuitry inside the op amp that selects which output to use depending on how, what the common mode voltage is. So that's what the op amp looks like. And the models will look at which pair is active and report the noise appropriately. 